Well, I wrote on a graduate school uh, application that while some children were taught to believe in God, I came to believe in the power of systems analysis. And I suppose uh, ours was a family where a certain form of analytic reasoning was something that was just in the air and part of what was discussed at uh, the dinner ta at the at the dinner table and certainly we had little auction schemes for allocating the rights to watch what was the only TV set uh, in the family but actually economics didn't play uh, a large role in my childhood and I left uh, high school to go to MIT thinking I was going to pursue mathematics uh, or physics as uh, fields and came to economics uh, really because uh, I wanted to use the kind of quantitative analytical tools one uses in thinking about uh, the hard sciences but also wanted to be involved in the issues of the day and it seemed to me that economics uh, gave one an opportunity to do uh, both of those things and I think the modes of reasoning uh, around uh, probabilities and uncertainties, around focusing on incentives, around thinking about issues of coordination that economics provides are enormously powerful and when more and more widely applied have uh, great potential to make the world a better place. I think I developed the habit of mind uh, very early on of not taking anything on faith. And so when somebody tells me it's generally accepted that, I tend to bristle and be skeptical about any proposition that's said to be generally accepted. And most of the time, things are generally accepted uh, for a reason. And that by taking that posture, you come to understand the reason why it's generally accepted to a greater extent. But sometimes, by having that reflexive skepticism and proclivity to challenge, you learn that the emperor doesn't have any clothes. You learn that it's less a proposition uh, than a platitude, and that's how interesting things uh, start, uh, to, uh, start to develop. So I try to maintain the habit of mind of uh, skepticism, and I try very hard also to not live with contradictory belief. And so I am, find myself constantly balancing the different things that I know, and when they seem inconsistent with each other, trying to understand which one is right or what the right uh, synthesis is. And sometimes that leads to uh, productive approaches, sometimes it leads me uh, to change my mind, Often it leads me to feel more secure in my prior belief, but without those exercises of challenge, I find it uh, very hard to know uh, and to believe things uh, with uh, conviction. And, you know, this is a kind of approach to thinking and approach to ideas that's very much uh, the habit of uh, science. It's uh, very much the habit of uh, debate, but it's something that is somewhat uh, less fashionable uh, than it once was. Uh, we have an administration that takes pride in the fact that its policies are based on faith and conviction rather than reason and uh, evidence. In a very different corner in large parts of the academic uh, world, uh, parts of the academic world that would almost define themselves by the opposition to what the administration stands for, there's a belief that truth is an arbitrary social construct or a reflection or a reflection of power relations uh, rather than reality and that the great virtue of debate is uh, respect for each other's positions. And I have very much the opposite uh, sense. The great virtue of debate is that you understand it better and you come closer to 
uh, a better answer. I think in some cases it's a comfortable worldview if you uh, lack the analytic techniques to deal with data and evidence, then it's comfortable to develop theories that render them uh, less relevant. And that, I think, is certainly a, uh, certainly a part of the story. I think another uh, part of uh, the story is that uh, people develop a conviction that you can't know things. And, you know, in some ultimate philosophical sense, that may be true, but decisions have to be made and people do make decisions. And it seems to me that it's better to think about more informed decisions and uh, less informed decisions. But with the luxury of not needing to decide, it is easier to take a relaxed view of what constitutes truth and what need there is for evidence than when there are consequential choices that if made more wisely will either have enormous benefits for people or have enormous costs uh, to people. And so I think the feeling of responsibility for action, um, which I've been fortunate to have in my time outside uh, and inside, uh, the university, I think, probably creates a greater sense of responsibility uh, to uh, debate. I think the lens through which I, I see things is, um, is analytic. It is analytic, it is evidence-based, uh, it is based on a need for internal uh, consistency, and I think the discipline that thinks about questions relating to the flow of capital or the distribution of income in those ways is the discipline that we call economics. But those habits of thought are important if you want to think about the future of relations between the United States and China, or if you want to think about how resources should be allocated to different parts of research in uh, the life sciences, or if you want to fight crime uh, effectively. So I don't think it's really the economics uh, approach uh, to, uh, to the world, but I, I do try to consistently bring to bear a focus on data, on thinking about incentives, on thinking about outcomes, and thinking about how systems can be modified to produce uh, better uh, outcomes. And I think thinking systematically in uh, that way can drive better outcomes. So when I, uh, when I was at the World, World Bank, uh, perhaps the most dramatic thing I did when I was there was do a substantial body of research that made the case that I think has stood up rather well that uh, sending girls to primary school was probably the highest social return investment you can make in the developing world. Well, I decided the place to present that work was in Pakistan, which stood out at that time for the fact that there were only 90 living women for every 100 men, in sharp contrast to what was true in the rest of the world. But in order to make that a presentation that would connect not just with my concerns, but with my audience's uh, concerns, uh, with the aid of others who were far more knowledgeable than I, I uh, reflected on some of those parts of the Quran uh, that extolled the importance of fair treatment of uh, girls and of women because I thought it was important to try to see that issue not just uh, through a kind of narrow-minded uh, prism of what would reduce mortality rates um, and the like, but through the prism through which others uh, were likely to see it. And I think that that kind of effort to understand uh, 
others is almost always availing. I think we'll get to the best place if we debate them and discuss them in the freest po in the freest possible way with as many perspectives brought to bear as possible and out of the argument will I think out of the best argument we are likely to see the best kinds of outcomes but that's going to require bringing many people to the table for that argument that's going to require putting a premium on really understanding the issues for those who are going to be involved in uh, the argument. That's going to put a uh, premium on being open to points of view that may at first seem unwise or, uh, unfa or unfashionable. And uh, those are the processes and aspects of the process that I think are likely to lead to better outcomes. I think that for all its problems, the American system does stand out uh, for its openness, for its reduced insistence on conformity, for its commitment uh, to reason, and therefore I'm hopeful uh, that we will find our way and that uh, leadership uh, from the United States will be essential in shaping the way all these developments play out internationally. Mm -hmm.